thank you for welcoming me to the conference this morning. Um, nice to see so many people early on a Monday morning. It's quite impressive. Let's go back. There we go. So, so I'm Nat. Um, I do work for MSA, and I'm also an emergency physician here in Sydney. I'm not representing MSF with this talk, um, so these are my own uh, reflections. Okay. So, what is a doctor? What is a nurse? What is a paramedic? Are we defined by being a good clinician? By being a good scientist? We all strive for excellence in those arenas. Maybe that's why some of you are here. Maybe what, that's what some of these talks are going to be about. How to recognize disease, how to predict outcomes, how to treat patients what medicines we can give to save lives, to, to mitigate morbidity. But it isn't always just about that. Sometimes you can be all those things and you still can't protect your patient. And sometimes you can't be those things. And so there has to be something more. What is a doctor? In July 2016, I went to work for MSF on the Jordan-Syrian border in a project where an MSF team was providing basic health care to some refugees in a complex situation. The backdrop to this story is that after admitting around 650,000 Syrian refugees, the Jordanians started tightening up their border in 2015. People fleeing places like Aleppo and Raqqa could no longer come easily through to Jordan. They couldn't go back to Syria, and so they began accumulating in a place we called the Berm. Around 80,000 of them by the time I arrived. I didn't know what a Berm was before I went to this project, but it just means mound of earth or pile of dirt. In fact, there were two um, piles of dirt that you can see them on the slide delineated by those red lines. They were between two and seven kilometers apart, and they ran along the Jordan-Syrian border, demarcating a demilitarized zone. You can see on the slide, uh, people were accumulating between the two berms and also north of the Syrian berm. And just off the, the far end of the slide there is the Iraq border. Uh, so it's, it's a tense situation for security, and it's quite an important strategic place. Um, The need was immense. 80% of the people accumulating in the Burma are women and children. They've been traumatized by the war, brutalized by the harsh conditions in the desert. It gets up to 50 degrees in the summer and down well below zero in the winter. And these are people that have not had access to regular health care since the war began, uh, so six, seven years now. You've got children that haven't been vaccinated. And there's no sanitation in this area. It's not a refugee camp. There's limited food and water. And there's very minimal access to health services. The Jordanian government and the international community are worried about security, but they did permit MSF and some other agencies to set up services at the, the southern berm, just on the Jordanian side. MSF was providing antenatal care and basic health care. We were seeing three, 400 patients a day. It wasn't enough. These meager offerings did not meet the needs of these people. But it was a start that we hoped to build on. On the 21st of June, 2016, a bomb exploded at the border. Six Jordanian soldiers were killed. ISIS claimed responsibility and the Jordanians closed the border completely. No agencies were permitted to offer services, and apart from a little bit of water, nothing got in, and nothing, and no one got out. When I arrived there, a few days after this bomb, my patients 
all 80,000 of them, were trapped behind the burn, invisible, unreachable. What is a doctor now? Can you be a scientist? I tried. I tried to get as much information as I could from behind the burn, from various sources. But unwitnessed data, unwitnessed pictures and videos are problematic. Agendas exist that are not easily understood, and it's difficult to verify sources. When you can't see what's happening, it's difficult to report accurately, to report scientifically about the situation. Nevertheless, there was understandable interest in this information. People outside the berm would ask, is the child in this video from a month ago alive or dead? What is wrong with the woman in this picture? Is this a picture of a gunshot wound? Is the child in this picture alive, or dead, or could they be alive? And those inside the berm asked, what is wrong with this man? This child died today. We don't know why. People are dying here. Why don't you do something? I feel frustrated. I feel frustrated too. I would ask them, how many people have this disease? How many women have died in childbirth? They just didn't know. So I couldn't be a clinician and I couldn't be a scientist. So what is a doctor now? What is left? I'll take you back to the berm, but um, first I want to go somewhere that might be a bit more familiar. There's a category two chest pain in cubicle five that hasn't been seen yet on 15 minutes. There's a child that is, has got appendicitis in bed 10 that the surgeons won't take without a CT scan. A strung out mother is trying to take her child out of the department against medical advice without having seen a doctor. The interventional cardiologist wants to take the lady in three to the cath lab and she's a palliative care patient. The med reg has chewed out one of your residents and she's crying in the toilets. There's a sepsis on inotropes in recess without an ICU bed and the bat phone just rang. So that's handover at the start of a busy ED shift. So what is a doctor now? It's easy, right? We treat patients, that's what we do. Or is it easy? How can you treat the chest pain in the best way if you don't have enough staff to see the patient in an appropriate time frame? How do you stop the kid from being irradiated unnecessarily? How do you, do you let the mother take her child away against medical advice without speaking to her first? Do you let the cardiologists see the right coronary artery or do you help them see the patient? We advocate. Advocacy is what we did a lot of in the berm and the people there found it very difficult to find their voice. And so we spent a lot of time trying to help them find their voice. But advocacy can be also necessary in the ED. You have people in the ED, and I talk about the ED because that's where I work, but in medicine in general, who may need you to advocate for them. So small children, elderly patients with dementia, patients who've had their capacity compromised by mental health and drug and alcohol. All these patients might need help to find their voice. So the clinical stuff, the human factors stuff, the teaching stuff, all super important, but it's not the whole story. It doesn't matter how good you are at putting in a central line or whether or not you're buying into the sepsis three definitions. It doesn't even matter how good you are at leading a resus team. If you don't advocate for your patients, they might not get the care that they need or they might get care that's not in their best interests. I want to take you 
on a story about whistleblowing. So advocacy at its pointy end um, can become what we call whistleblowing. How far would you go? Would you advocate for patients who are victims of a systematic problem that's either incompetence, unethical, illegal, how far would you go? Dr. Kim Holt, uh, with her permission, I will tell this story. Um, and I would need to say before I start that I've not been intimately involved in this case, and there are complexities and ambiguities to it which are beyond the scope of this talk, and things that remain also in dispute. But uh, Dr. Kim Holt is a community pediatrician from the UK. And in 2004, she took a position as a community pediatric consultant in Haringey in North London. This clinic primarily saw vulnerable children um, from low socioeconomic groups, many of whom were on the child at risk register or the child protection register in the UK. And this clinic even though it was in a deprived area, was managed and attached to the world-famous Great Ormond Street Hospital. Within a few months of arriving there, Dr. Holt found several issues in the way that the clinic was being run that she felt were impacting the children and the vulnerable population they were looking after. She felt that the clinic was understaffed, that the staff did not have appropriate training in child protection and that they didn't have access to all of the records of the child's history. So there was poor documentation, and people didn't know, for example, that they'd been, children had also been seen by social services. She raised these issues with her three consultant colleagues with Great Ormond Street Hospital several times, and um, including in writing, and she never felt that these concerns were addressed to a professional standard. She was encouraged to be signed off with stress in 2006 and was then suspended from her position for reasons that remain a little unclear to me. So this is baby P. And by the time that baby P was seen on the 1st of August 2007, Dr. Holt was still signed off and suspended. And the three other consultants that she'd been working with her were also no longer working at the uh, clinic. Baby P was seen by a locum junior consultant pediatrician without the required training in child protection. He was not fully examined, and the consultant did not have access to the information that Baby P had been seen over 60 times by health services and other services, including social services, during his short life. And he was discharged. Two days later, Baby P was found dead in his cot. At autopsy, he had over 50 injuries, many of which were reported to have been present two days before when he was seen in clinic. Dr. Holt spoke out loudly and publicly about the misgivings she had about the management of the clinic, and she stated that she felt that had those been addressed, the death of baby P could have been pre prevented. She remained on suspension, and she reports that she was offered the termination of her contract. And in that termination document, there was inclusion of 120,000 pounds gagging clause. She refused to sign this contract. She refused to stop talking about baby P and about the mismanagement of the clinic. And she remained on suspension for over four years, finally being reinstated in 2011, at which point she received an apology from Great Ormond Street Hospital. So I wanted to talk about Dr. Holt and Baby P because I wanted to give you an example of the complexity of whistleblowing, but also because I wanted to show you the potential for personal cost at the pointy end of advocacy, the place where advocacy becomes whistleblowing. It's not easy um, to talk loudly about something, especially when that thing is being reported in the media. People don't like loud whistles. 
They might ask you to be quiet. They might tell you to be quiet. They might find ways to try to make you be quiet. Your credibility could be questioned, like Dr. Holtz was repeatedly. You might find it difficult to return to work, to not be gagged, to be a David in a room full of Goliaths. The berm was also a place where there was significant risk associated with advocacy. It's not limited to whistleblowing in developed contexts. There's institutional risk, personal risk. We needed to constantly do a risk-benefit evaluation about the way that we were advocating. What is the risk to MSF? What is the risk to the team? What is the personal risk? And most importantly, what is the risk to the people that you're advocating for? What might happen if you say the wrong thing. When you run a team, when you're responsible for running a team, and you elect to continue advocating, you put your team at risk. But these are not easy things. They're not easy for doctors, and they're not easy for medical students. And the institutional support for whistleblowers can seem a little bit precarious, um, going back to, to Dr. Holt. There are a patchwork of laws in Australia protecting whistleblowers, and lots of agencies and organizations have whistleblowing policies. However, these things sit cheek by jowl with laws like the Australian Border Force Act 2015 which gags doctors working in Nauru and Manus from talking about their experiences in the interests of national security. So, how far would you go with advocacy? How much would you risk? And do you see it as something that partly defines you? Maybe not maybe because it's woolly and ill-defined. We sort of think it's covered by communication skills, public health, maybe somebody higher up is doing it. We don't like it because it's political, or maybe it's just not part of our job. After all, we've got enough to do. So maybe you're all sitting on the fence. You don't want to accept advocacy as part of your job. Even if you're all in, you need to get ready to lose. Loss. We all know what it's like to lose a patient or to be involved in a case where a patient is lost. And I don't mean the 86-year-old palliative care patient, the one you advocated for, the one that had a good death, the death that she wanted. I mean the one that feels like a loss the one that came too late, had their life-threatening event at the wrong place at the wrong time, did something we all did when we were younger but got unlucky, didn't want to bother anyone, the one we threw everything we had at and they still didn't make it, the one that feels like a loss. Hold that feeling in your hand for a second and multiply it. The losses in advocacy can be so tremendous. They can come at the end of months of work, sacrifices, risk, and they can be unclear. Have you lost the game or the match? Have you lost or have you given up? In the burn, after eight months of advocacy, MSF had has taken the difficult decision to disengage. The reasons behind this are very complex. Partly to do with risk, partly to do with the fact that we felt that we were a lone voice that was not being heard, nothing was moving. And partly because we felt we were at risk of being instrumentalized, being used against the people that we were trying to help. But that decision was very difficult and discussed at length at all levels. But now we are 
stepped back and observing, waiting for an opportunity to re-engage with the burn. But it's okay. Loss does not define advocacy. <laughs> Some of the greatest wins I've ever seen have come from advocacy. And perhaps more importantly, every single shift I do in the emergency department, I have a win from advocacy and I see my colleagues having them. So the strung out mum that wanted to leave the department we advocated with her to stay, to see the doctor. And her son was diagnosed with Kawasaki's and admitted and didn't die. The palliative care patient was my patient. The kid in turn with the appendicitis is my patient probably every week. <laughs> so a lot of wins from advocacy at that individual level all the time. And MSF has a long history of advocacy wins. But I don't really need to tell you guys about advocacy wins, do I? Because AMSA has a very long history of advocacy and being active and a lot of achievements, two of which I've listed on this slide, but there's far too many to mention. So I hope that you can see that advocacy in all its forms has value. Dividing it up into wins and losses is, is simplistic. It actually, in my opinion, has inherent value. All patients who need it deserve to be advocated for. So how do we do it? I have a um, disclaimer to make. I don't have a degree in advocacy. So <laughs> um, I also don't have a lot of formal training. Um, so the things I'm going to share with you are based on my experiences and, and things that have worked o over time. Um, Storytelling. So for me, this is a central part of advocacy. Tell their story. So we did a lot of this in the berm. We utilized the information that we could from inside the berm to give those people a voice. And that meant trying to engage with journalists, writing our own stories. And we have to be careful. Some stories can't be told. Some stories can't be told because they can't be verified, which is very painful when you feel like you know that story is true. Um, some stories must be told as apocryphal. Some stories must be leaked. Um, but tell their story. It's their voice that you're trying to find. And I'm just going to give an example uh, of this from the burn, which also gives a bit more of a summary of the, the situation there. Let's see if we can get this working. Okay, no volume. Oh. Just talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> We've reported extensively from this region about Syrian refugees who are living in camps, Syrian refugees who are urban refugees living in cities and in towns. But these tens of thousands of Syrian refugees are living in the middle of nowhere in a place that, according to uh, aid agencies, is not a refugee camp. They fled their homes in search of safety, but this is where their journey ended, a makeshift graveyard in no man's land between Jordan and Syria. Dozens are said to be buried here. This desolate desert known as the Berm is where more than 75,000 Syrian refugees have been stranded for months, surviving almost on nothing. They can't go back. They can't come forward into Jordan and they are not really even permitted to exist where they are. So they're sort of being insidiously phased out of existence, um, almost like ghosts. They're not seen. Um, and they're not recognized by, by any entity. As Jordan tightened its border with Syria late last year, allowing only small numbers of refugees across, the population at the berm grew. In June, access for aid agencies became impossible after a suicide attack by ISIS on Jordanian border guard killed at least six troops, 
the kingdom sealed off the berm, declaring it a closed military zone. There's been one food drop since the bombing, and that was for 30 days, and that ran out um, on the 2nd of September. So there's no meaningful sanitation there, there's no protection, there's no access to health care. The World Food Programme had to use a crane to make that single food drop into the berm in early August. Our requests to visit the area were denied by the Jordanian military, citing security concerns. But through Syrian activists and cell phone footage filmed for CNN, we got a glimpse into the dire living conditions. In the scorching desert heat and in makeshift tents, they've been receiving limited amounts of water. There have been reports of newborn deaths, deaths from a hepatitis outbreak and cases of severe dehydration. This mother says she's been in the berm for about a year. Her baby girl has no milk, no food, just a little bit of boiled rice. Abu Muhammad from Homs says his four-month-old son is buried here. He needed medicine and oxygen but there's no hospitals, he says. This old woman says, I have no one. I'm hungry and thirsty. Help me. With no access, aid agencies say it's hard to assess the true scale of human suffering at the berm. Jordan, which is hosting more than a million Syrians, says the nation's security is its top priority. It says the area is becoming an ISIS enclave. In a statement to CNN, the government says, we're in continuous discussion with aid agencies regarding this issue, and we continue to emphasize Jordan's legitimate security concerns and the best way aid can be delivered. This is an international problem, not Jordan's problem. For now, they use what they can to prepare for a harsh winter ahead as they wait for the world to decide on their fate. So, I hope that you can see um, how politics is so is completely bound up with what's happening in the burn. And I think that that is one of the things that separates advocacy out from other parts of communication skills. So it recognizes politics. And I'm going to say something that's maybe a bit controversial, but I stand by it. Medicine is inherently political. The healthcare structures that we employ, who has access to healthcare globally, but also uh, in, your, in Australia? Who, how is healthcare funded? The social determinants of health, lack of resources, lack of political will to supply resources. These things are all political. So I've worked in places where even ET tubes are recycled. The background to this problem is always political. And the solution is very rarely to gift a bunch of ET tubes and do a press release about it. That you'd be surprised about how often that happens. Even in Australia, we see shortages of generic drugs like ampicillin. And this is happening because of the political and economic structure of research and development in the pharmaceutical industry. So politics is in the burn for sure. People in the berm ended up there because of a war. They were born in the wrong place at the wrong time, but really because of politics. But it's also in your ED. It's in your GP surgery. It's in your operating theater. We need to accept it and embrace it and think about how it impacts our patient's ability to access health care. And by extension, how we can maneuver with advocacy to protect Network and relationship building. So it's much easier to get the med reg to chill out if you have a prior relationship with her. Um, if you made her a cup of tea the last time she had 15 referrals on arrival to your ED. If you put in that difficult cannula when you had more time than she had. This is called being a good human, <laughs> but it also builds a relationship. If you're kind to somebody, they remember, and then you have a relationship, you have a basis to have a dialogue when things are more difficult, like when she's shouting at your resident. In the berm, this translated to having a relationship with the other entities involved, so the UN agencies involved, the government, the military, military intelligence. Having a cordial 
relationship and regular contact with those entities, having them over for a cup of tea and having a discussion is important. Um, you understand more about their agenda. You understand more about the way that they're operating. And it moves forward your ability to advocate for your patients in a constructive way. People say that kindness doesn't cost anything, but it does. It can take the most enormous amount of effort when you're under pressure, exhausted. Um, but it's important. It's important to give that kindness and to find that energy within yourself because it can help you protect your patients. Understanding influence. I think this is a really key thing in advocacy. You need to know who has the real power over a situation, who has the real influence. Not just the agencies involved, but the individuals. Power is not distributed the way it is on paper. Think about Scrubs. One of the most powerful people in Scrubs is the janitor. And once you understand this, and who has real influence over the situation, you can utilize it to maneuver with advocacy. You need to understand the incentives and disincentives for that individual to use their influence in the way that you hope is positive for your patients. And then there's a situation when the most powerful person in the room doesn't realize it. The palliative care patient is the most powerful person in the room. Advocacy is not about being paternalistic. It's about helping a person find their voice. Getting that patient to realize that they can say no to an intervention that's being rushed through with a quick sign here, or yes, of course. So allowing you, your opinion to take a back seat and facilitating them coming to the fore. Only when they cannot speak for themselves may you speak for them. Graded advocacy. So I've nicked this term from um, uh, crisis resource management, uh, graded assertiveness, which some of you may be familiar with, but I think it also can apply here. So a step-by-step -step approach to the volume of your advocacy. Is it a conversation in private with the person concerned? Is it a conversation with that person's boss? Is it an email? Is it an email CCing some people? Is it a meeting? Is it leaking something to the media or is it going out loud and proud on the record with a story and speaking out? Um, those things all carry different risk levels and they may carry different impact levels. And how you escalate up that ladder um, is going to be important and it will impact the success or lack thereof of your, of your advocacy. So you need to consider how loud you want to be. And it's linked inextricably with this um, wordsmithing, which is not actually a word, but <laughs> I like it. Um, what this is, is um, crafting your message. So if you think about politicians, the way they get away with a lot of the stuff they say is that they have wordsmiths on their staff that you know, design their speeches just on the right side of this or that. Um, and this is also something that we need to think about in advocacy. Every word matters, and accuracy is very important, which reflects back to some of the issues in the berm that we had with sourcing some of the materials that we had. Um, you need to be careful that you don't do damage to yourself or your organization or to your patients by the way that you craft your message. And sometimes you can have a lot more impact um, simply by the way that you've wordsmithed what you're going to say. Um, when to push. So I'm a pusher. <laughs> I won't deny it. Um, I think that that's a natural tendency when you're a doctor and you have 80,000 patients behind a mound of dirt. Um, but sometimes you can push so hard you can push it over. 
So sometimes you have to wait. Sometimes you have to lose the battle to win the war. And I think, I hope, that that's where we are right now with the burn. I can't tell you when to push and when to wait. You have to feel it. So James Orbinski was the MSF president in 1999 when MSF was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And he said in his acceptance speech, silence has long been confused with neutrality. We are not certain that words can save lives, but we know that silence can certainly kill. So I wanted to have you all realize that almost certainly you're already all advocates. How far you decide to go with advocacy is up to you. What is a doctor? What is a nurse? What is a paramedic? Many things, but surely an advocate. Thank you. Thanks so much about your morning coffee. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. So it's 2 a.m. at Nat's time zone at the moment, and she hasn't had her morning coffee, so we can just give her a minute. Um, if anyone would like to ask any questions, we have microphones in the aisle or type a question into the app and I'll ask Nat for you. Um, so Nat, I might just start us off. Oh. Um, I think there are probably a lot of people in the audience who are thinking about working for MSF in the future. Do you have any words of advice for someone at a medical student level who's interested in getting involved? Absolutely, you need to come to our session in like at 11.15 <laughs> because um, my colleague Cass and I are gonna be talking about that exact thing. Um, yeah, so, uh, we will go through all the process and all the things that you can do to, to maybe um, support a future in MSF um, during that session. Um, the website is actually really comprehensive. So if you want to have a look at that um, before, before that session or you're not able to come to that session, the, ses the website does give you a lot of information about um, what kind of things you need to work for MSF in the future. So if you are interested, have a look because um, you can take, you can start the process now in terms of gaining the skills that you need and getting interested in the kind of things that, that you need to be interested in. Mm -hmm. We've had a few questions coming on the app. So one is, how do you manage with the loss of so many people in a situation like this? Um, how do you not suffer emotional burnout? Yeah, this is a, an interesting question. Um, I, 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 honestly, I, I had failed at that in the past in terms of not with the band particularly, but um, when I was more junior. And I think it is a risk in MSF, um, you know, as it is in medicine in general. You see a lot of difficult things um, and you need to protect yourself. So for me, I've established over the years a number of um, techniques to protect myself and I know when I'm at that stage where I need to take a step back um, I try and build in healthy components to my lifestyle and utilize some of the um, burnout stuff that's available I don't do very long missions um, I was in the band for six months some people do missions for like one two years I can't do that so you need to know yourself um, and prepare yourself before you go for, for these kind of things. It's not easy, but as I say, I think this is something that we see in all of medicine, it's not just in MSF. So now, even as students, um, you're faced with difficult things quite frequently. So establishing good practices to protect yourself from burnout is important. Yeah, we have a um, panel on Dr. Mental Health tomorrow morning at 10, so why not to miss as well? Um, just one more question from the app, and then if anyone has a question from the audience, please make your way to a microphone. Uh, how do we advocate for our colleagues and patients in state-sponsored conflicts where they deliberately target healthcare systems and hospitals? Um, so you're talking about conflicts like Syria? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, look, I think it's very difficult. MSF does advocate 
on, on these topics. Um, my colleague, Cass Thomas, who is um, going to be doing with the, ses the session with me later, has a long history of advocating after the Kunduz bombing um, in, in Afghanistan. Um, we are facing this very difficult new paradigm of hospitals being bombed um, in a lot of these state-sponsored conflicts that you're referring to. Um, and that's a key area of advocacy for MSF, both um, in bilateral or private advocacy, but also publicly. Um, these things are not easy. Getting things moving um, in the right direction is, is extremely complicated um, and reliant on very difficult structures. So um, the UN structure, international humanitarian law, and, and whether or not um, governments are prepared to, to stay alongside of that and how we police that as, you know, globally. So these are tricky issues. I think keeping the discussion alive and make, making space to talk about it in different forums, in different ways, and highlighting it, which is what MSF keeps doing, um, is important. But it's, it's not e easy to solve. Wonderful, great. Thank you so much. That's probably all we have time for. So could we have another round of applause for Dr. Nat Bertel? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, so just we're going to have a few words from Rob, who's going to introduce...